pull from some insights that are from Professor Robert Bjork that joins us today. So learning is actually a scientific process that is um, not something we do innately in a way that is productive or efficiently. It's something that actually needs to be taught regardless of my cognitive profile. When we rely on intuition to learn, we usually learn, uh, we apply techniques that are not the most efficient. In fact, they, they score very low in terms of the efficacy. So uh, these are insights from research that Robert Bjork has conducted over the years. Professor Bjork, tell us what learning success looks like. Basic problem in terms of learning success and defining it is that a learner can respond to immediate uh, sense of familiarity, immediate ability to recall something, reproduce it. And those things are very misleading as to whether learning has been achieved, learning of the type that will lead to memory later and transfer of what's been learned to the situations where it's relevant. And very, very broadly, students can kind of fall into a trap thinking that they work like some sort of recording apparatus, that if they conscientiously take notes or, or pay attention, that the information will kind of write itself on them. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. That is, learning happens when new information and concepts are linked up with what you already know. And it's an interpretation kind of process that creates learning. And so to the extent that students don't have that kind of background uh, and think that something like highlighting, repeatedly rereading text will create learning, uh, they're engaging in processes that are extraordinarily inefficient versus um, generating information, thinking how it applies, even the various natural kind of activities that students can do interacting with each other when they study together will often exercise uh, very effective processes. But it's very easy to be fooled basically as to whether the learning has been achieved that will support your later retention on an exam or in a real world context where <clears throat> information and procedures are relevant. Can we bring this to life with them? Perhaps a ridiculous example that may be true. Let's say we have a valedictorian that never studied the science of learning. How did they get straight A's throughout their whole life? Could they have possibly been performing academically without necessarily having been learning? Could you explain the difference perhaps between learning in a way that's durable, deep, and fosters transfer and maybe explain why that's important? Yes, I mean, one, one reason that can happen is that uh, their competition, so to speak, if you want to think of it that way, other students <clears throat> are also probably not um, studying and learning in an actual optimal kind of way. And teachers can be misled strongly. And so uh, there's a lot of reasons to use ineffective things. Uh, highlighting may make you feel like uh, you're not falling asleep, you're doing something ac active. Uh, Rereading uh, is important, but rereading right away is a useless use of time. Whereas rereading a chapter again after a week is quite productive. So students don't tend to understand the power of spacing repeated study opportunities, uh, which can on long-term tests can increase performance by a factor of two often. For those that don't know, the spacing is one of uh, four key retrieval strategies that have a lot of uh, research on their efficacy. And um, this, this is important because a lot of students will cram and do well. And this doesn't say that cramming does not allow you to do well. The real question here is for how long do you want to learn? Do you want to learn for a day or do you want to remember and convert the information into usable knowledge for the future? Which gets into the important point of transfer, right? So would you say that um, spacing contributes to deeper learning, which uh, allows you to amass knowledge in a way that can create a more critical thinker and a more creative thinker? Or would you say that that's a stretch? I think across the entire history of research on 
human learning and cognition, it's hard actually to find a single empirical effect that's larger and more consistent than what's called the spacing effect. It actually traces back 115 years to the origins of experimental research on how people learn. But, it, but students can get into a pattern of massing or blocking or cramming uh, for a number of reasons. One is just poor time management, like uh, I myself was guilty of during my entire undergraduate career, where there's no choice but to cram towards the end, often all night before a morning exam. And what can be really misleading is cramming can actually create quite good performance uh, on a very short term. Uh, I probably saved my grade point average by that cramming. Right. But then after that, forgetting is extraordinarily rapid. So if what you're learning is important for future learning, it's a terrible idea to, to cram. And, and activities like spacing and retrieval practice are just crucial for long-term memory.